I'm Bob Hathaway. I have the great honor of being the director of the Asia program here at the Wilson Center. Um, since some of you are not regular visitors here, and in fact others are watching uh, elsewhere around the world, uh, I hope you'll permit me to tell you just a couple sentences about the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, we are an independent, nonpartisan uh, institute for advanced research. Uh, we were created by an act of Congress, which distinguishes us from most of our peers uh, around town. Uh, we are created by the Congress in 1968 as the nation's official memorial to our 28th president, who, as I expect you all know, um, had a uh, distinguished career as a scholar prior to entering the political arena himself. Um, the Wilson Center seeks to promote uh, research, writing, dialogue on important public policy events and their historical and cultural backgrounds, um, and in essence to serve as a bridge between, on the one hand, the world of the scholar, and the other hand, the world of the policymaker. More than a decade ago, the Wilson Center uh, made a decision to substantially increase the attention we pay to Pakistan. Um, one example of that heightened attention um, is the appointment we make each year of a Pakistan scholar, someone who comes from Pakistan and spends nine months with us uh, writing a book. Uh, many of you met um, our most recent Pakistan scholar, the distinguished journalist, Karim Hussain, uh, who just left to return to Pakistan. Uh, we are looking forward to the arrival in September of our next Pakistan scholar, uh, Dr. Fuzia Saeed. Um, this conference today is another example of the new emphasis, uh, now a decade long, uh, not quite so new, uh, but what we're trying to do with our Pakistan program. Um, we held a day-long conference in partnership with the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan, um, a conference focusing each year on Pakistan and particularly some of the economic challenges uh, Pakistan uh, faces. Um, last year, uh, we focused on um, urbanization issues. Uh, we have looked at trade, uh, food security, water security, education, um, and this year, uh, of course, we're taking another look um, at the challenges Pakistan faces in the energy sector. Um, each of these conferences has been followed by the publication of a conference report. Um, you will have seen copies of our two most recent reports um, out on the table as you came in. Um, if you didn't pick one out up on your way in, by all means, pick one up and take it with you on the way out. Um, and we will, of course, be producing another report following this conference. Today, um, and in the conference report uh, that follows it, um, we will take another look at what has been described as a greater threat to Pakistan than terrorism. Uh, the country's deep and seemingly implacable energy crisis. Um, some of you with long memories may remember that a few years ago uh, we hosted um, another conference of this nature uh, on energy. Uh, unfortunately, the difficulties Pakistan faces in the energy arena have only increased uh, since that conference. Uh, indeed, according to a story in Dawn last week, uh, the current water and power minister uh, has been reduced to invoking the deity's help um, in meeting uh, the serious electricity shortages. Um, that are making uh, life so miserable for so many Pakistanis this summer. Uh, it may well be that the minister is right, that divine intervention is called for, uh, but as the basis for a government policy and strategy for addressing Pakistan's energy shortfalls, um, I'm inclined to think that that approach, it 
by itself may not be sufficient. Um, so that's what we're about here today. Um, we want to see if we can generate some more ideas um, that have a practical near-term impact. Now, I think there's actually some reason to be optimistic because the people who follow the energy sector in Pakistan widely agree on what needs to be done. I don't think it's any great mystery about some of the steps that need to be taken. Um, the problem today and in the past, uh, extending back many decades and certainly over many governments, um, is that there's a huge gap between this knowledge or this consensus about what needs to be done and actually doing it. Um, we're going to focus on this conference today specifically on steps that might be taken in the near term, uh, steps that recognize the urgency of the crisis in Pakistan, um, and um, we hope we will generate ideas that can have an appreciable impact in the near term, that is the next 18 months to three or four years. Um, so the next conference will look at a longer term strategy, but today I hope that we will focus primarily on steps that will have a immediate impact. A couple of housekeeping details, if you will permit me. Um, hopefully most of you picked up uh, coffee or tea and juice and fruit and other things out there. Uh, eventually the food will disappear, but there'll be coffee and other uh, drinks out there for the whole day. So as you feel uh, the need to replenish your cup, please just go out and help yourself. Restrooms, out these two doors, and then straight down the hall to the left. Um, I would ask you all at this point, and I know this is uh, difficult for many of us to do, but I would ask you to uh, cut off uh, your mobile devices because they interfere with the webcasting of this. And people around the world, including in Pakistan, are watching this right now. Uh, and we don't want our devices here in this room to mess up their reception. Um, we will have lots of opportunities during the course of the day uh, to bring you into this discussion. Um, you will be, we'll recognize you, whoever is moderating will recognize you. We would simply request that you wait till we get a microphone to you um, and that you identify yourself and that hopefully you keep your comments um, fairly brief so that we can get a maximum number of people uh, involved in the discussion. Lastly, though in some ways most importantly, um, as many, most of you know, putting on a conference like, like this um, uh, means that uh, Wilson Center uh, has incurred many debts. Um, our most important debt is to our speakers, many of whom who have come from literally halfway around the world, some of whom have had their luggage disappear in transit. Um, all of whom are immensely busy and have all sorts of demands upon them and their time, and so we are immensely grateful um, for you coming uh, and giving uh, us your time today. Um, secondly, to those in Pakistan and the United States who have demonstrated their confidence in our Pakistan programming by the very tangible means of financial support. Uh, we thank you. Um, in this context, I'd like to particularly single out the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan, uh, which is a Karachi-based charitable trust uh, with whom we have partnered now for 11 of these annual conferences. Um, for beginning in September, uh, 11 of our Pakistan scholars. Um, and I want to say right now, publicly, uh, that Absent the support uh, of the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan, we couldn't do this. Um, so we have a huge debt uh, to them. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our Wilson Center partners in the program on global resiliency and, uh, sorry, uh, global sustainability and resilience, um, who have helped us uh, publicize this event and who have lent us some of their staff. Um, uh, 
to support the event during the course of the day. Um, and finally, uh, I want to thank my own staff who uh, worked so hard to make this possible, some of whom I believe are here, uh, some of whom I think are outside. Uh, where's Michael? Is Michael Kugelman here? Michael, uh, more so than anybody, uh, put this together. And uh, those of you who know the Asia program and, and, and know us uh, understand that Michael does virtually all the work, and I just stand up here at front and blab on. So uh, it's a pretty good deal. Thanks, Michael. Uh, also, I don't think they're here, but uh, or Joshua's here, but Joshua Spooner, also Mary Ratliff. Uh, so um, they're the ones that make this whole operation uh, run on time. Now, let's get on to what you're here for, uh, uh, our uh, first speaker. Um, I am delighted that uh, Minister of State and Special Assistant to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mosaddegh Malik, uh, is with us. Uh, he's one of those that I referred to a few minutes ago who have incredible demands on his time, and yet he made the time to come here, and uh, we thank you, uh, Dr. Malik. Um, Prior to assuming his current responsibilities uh, in the last previous, uh, in the last caretaker government, uh, Dr. Malik served as federal minister of water and power. Um, he is frequently described as the architect of Pakistan's power policy and strategy. Uh, in other words, he's the right guy to have in this room today. Um, earlier in his career, he assisted the provincial government of Punjab uh, in developing strategies uh, for health insurance, uh, for social protection, for micro microcredit banking. Uh, he has lived uh, for many years in the United States, studied here, has a PhD from the University of Illinois. Uh, Dr. Malik, we're delighted to welcome you to the Wilson Center, and we're, I'm delighted to get out of your way and turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I was just in the cab talking to my wife, and I told her that they've given me 35 minutes to talk about the power challenges and some strategies in Pakistan, and she al almost fell from the chair. Um, my wife believes I have what is called an alligator syndrome, big mouth, no ears. <laughs> so I'll continue to speak, and, and today, as luck would have it, I'm standing here on the podium, so my job is to speak and yours is to listen. But if you get done with your job before I get done with mine, please let me know. <laughs> because it happens quite often. Uh, what I would like to do today is talk to you a little bit about the power challenges in Pakistan, uh, talk to you about the salient features of our new organizing principles, the new principles around which we've created our strategy, and then, as you mentioned, talk specifically about the short to medium term things that we're trying to do in Pakistan. And as I go along, I'll talk about the challenges that we encounter. So I begin first with aspirations. What is this power policy or power strategy all about? We live in a world where we're having about 8 to 12 hours of load shedding. Last year, when I made this presentation, it was 10 to 14 hours of load shedding. And it just continues in this zone. And we'd like to build a country where we have enough power, which basically gives comfort to our people and, 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 and a life of integrity, and, and also allows us to do development and, and, and continue along the trajectory of economic growth. That's what we'd like to see. We're in a country where the cost of power to the end consumer is very high. And we'd like to basically create a framework in which we can most of the poor people of Pakistan, and Pakistan is a reasonably poor country, we, we can provide them not just electricity, but electricity that they can afford comfortably. And they don't have to think about putting food on the table or sending kids to the school or lighting uh, a bulb or, 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 or having a refrigerator. So those tough choices, we'd like our people to get out of making those tough choices and have affordable energy. We also live in a country right now where as you know, probably, that South Asia is one of the most inefficient power markets of the world, and Pakistan is one of the most inefficient power markets within South Asia. And our aspiration is, if nothing else, in the next four to five years, to be the most efficient 
power market or power economy in South Asia. And finally, you must have, if you're reading Dawn, and I'm quite surprised at the words that you use, Dawn and, and, and the news and so on and so forth. You guys are probably uh, better read than I am. But if you are reading Dawn and, 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 and the news and so on and so forth and, and some Pakistan, and you're acquainted with Pakistan, uh, Pakistan uh, journalism, then, then you know that we over and over and over run into this issue of circular debt, which basically means that we don't have a viable, don't have a sustainable power economy. And we'd like to build a power economy which is sustainable, which is affordable, and which gives confidence to our investors that if they came to Pakistan, in real terms, they would be making 20%, north of 20% return on equities uh, with, with, with federal government's guarantees. And it's not a hoaxy idea which is going to be compromised by, by, by the circular debt popping its ugly head up over and over again. So this basically, broadly speaking, is the world that we're trying to construct in, in, in the power economy in Pakistan. We've come up some, with some very specific targets that we're chasing right now, and the chase is on. We're one year into this chase. Uh, we, as of last year, on average, had about 5,000 megawatts of shortfall between demand and supply, and we'd like to bring it down to zero within the next five years. When we began, uh, we right now are providing electricity at 14.6 cents or 14.7 cents to the end consumer per unit. And, and just to give you a sense, in the wholesale market in India, in our neighboring country, power is getting traded at around seven cents. So there's an enormous uh, cost differential uh, and, and the burden, economic burden of electricity that falls on our end consumers and also on our commercial and, uh, and industrial uh, enterprises, which makes them or compromises their competitiveness. So we'd like to make sure that over a period of time, within reason, we bring the cost to the end consumer close to 12 cents and the cost of production certainly below uh, in, in single digits, maintain it in single digits. Uh, we right now have uh, technical T&D losses, you know, the transmission and distribution losses north of 21 percent, closer to 22 percent. And most of this is, is distribution, distribution losses and most of that is theft. So over a short period of time, we'd like to bring it down to around 16%. And then over a reasonable period of time, like all of the reasonable countries, we'd like to have not have transmission and distribution losses of more than 10%. And that's what we're chasing. And finally, our collections are right now on average at 87%. And we'd like to increase our collection rate to 95%. And now our new hope and the new targets are closer to 99%, 98 99%. Uh, so this basically, specifically, these are the targets that we are chasing in, in our new reform agenda. What are the issues? Three major issues, as I've already alluded to. Number one, big supply-demand gap. Number two, affordability to the end consumer, for the end consumer. And number three, uh, efficiencies and what I call efficiency in Pakistan is a code word for, for pilferage. So these are the three major areas, three major hurdles that we're trying to overcome. Just to give you a sense of what it is, this, day, this, this information is slightly dated. So in 2012, we had an average gap between supply and demand of about 5,000 megawatts, which was lending itself at, a given, at any given point in time to about 10 to 12 hours of load shedding. Now, as you guys know, load shedding is not equally distributed on an everyday basis or within the day by hour by hour basis or across the year month by month basis. So this load shedding peaked around June to about 6,000 megawatts, which lent itself to then 14 hours of load shedding. And this is exactly what was happening last year when we went into the elections. It was, it was really, really a bad year for us. Uh, so that was the first issue. I gave you an overview of supply and demand. And the second challenge that we have is the challenge of affordability. When I did the audit last year, which was in 2013, the average cost of production of electricity, a unit of electricity cost of production generation was about nine, nine, and nine, nine cents and change. Uh, and this high cost, and i just give, given you a sense that in India, it's getting traded at around seven cents, and we're producing it at around nine point some cents. So why this differential? And the answer lies in the energy mix that we have. If you look at, look at our energy mix, you find out that about 44% of our energy is coming from either, uh, either, either uh, diesel or, 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 or RFO, furnace oil. Or, or mixed fuel. And because of the burden, because of the high cost of, of, of oil, 
uh, our cost of production has, has gone up quite significantly, and that's uh, compromising uh, our competitiveness as well as putting a burden of electricity or burden of, of energy on our end consumer. As if that was not bad enough, as if the cost of production was not bad enough, uh, we also have challenges of, of, of distribution. Look at the transmission and distribution losses in Pakistan. Am I in your way? Anyone's way? Do you want me to move? Uh, so if you, if you look at the transmission and distribution losses in Pakistan, they're north of 21 percent. That's very high. And the biggest chunk in this are the distribution losses, not just the transmission losses, although we can improve transmission losses as well. But if we spend all of our energies improving, moving from 2.2 percent to 2.5 percent to 2.3 percent, that's not a, a, a great focus or, or an optimal focus for us. So our focus is that 19 percent or north of 19 percent of distribution losses. And that's where all of this theft and all of this pilferage and all of this corruption is hidden. And that's where all of these inefficiencies are. That's where all of this mismanagement is. And that basically is the focus of our attention now. Um, and as if not just producing higher, more expensive electricity or doing enormous transmission and distribution losses was bad enough, even after doing all of those losses, we don't collect uh, our, our money. So if you look, look, at, look, look here, look here at Kesco, which is one of our, I don't know if we have a laser pointer here. Yeah, look at this, look at this. So we start with 100 units of electricity. 100 units of electricity are, 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 are produced at a very high cost, problem number one. In our transmission and distribution, we lose about 22 of those units, really, really bad. So 22 units are lost. Now you're left with about, what, 70, 78, if my math is right, 78 units. And look at this. Of those 78 units delivered, we are only collecting about 33% about or 32% of, of 78 units. Now, when you have a power economy like this, you may as well begin to give out electricity for free, because at least you'd get some political mileage out of it. I mean, what's the point? Seriously, I mean, think about it. I mean, losing, and, and, and if you look at these, the losses, the losses are not equally distributed across, and I'd show you some slides, across all the distribution companies. So in, for example, in this or this distribution company, if your losses are about 25, 30%, and then you're collecting of 75%, you're collecting about 30% and 50% of 75%, oh my God, you may as well go and give free electricity and win the next election because you're giving free electricity and print then a lot of, lot of rupees so that IMF and, and all of the, the think tank groups can come and grab us by the, by the collar. Uh, but at least we'll win the elections. Uh, but n this is not a sustainable framework and we need to change uh, these problems that we, we encountering in our power economy. So as a consequence, when our regulator assessed the cost of delivering electricity to the end consumer, it turned out to be 14.67 cents. This was last year, and we now have a new revision, which is right now getting uh, analyzed. And we were selling electricity at that point in time at 8.8 .8 rupees, or 8.8 .8 cents per unit. So there was a gap of about six cents per unit. Every time we produced a unit of electricity, we were losing six cents, and this six cent was culminating into $5 billion worth of circular debt that you hear about over and over and over again. Now, with all of these adjustments, the, the tariff that we are now charging, the effective tariff that we are charging to the end consumer has gone up. But in that process, we, protect, we have protected the abject poor. Let me take a, take a second and tell you whom we've protected. We've protected people who are using less than 200 to 300 units. Primarily, we've protected people who are using less than 200 units. These are domestic consumers. And we've protected people marginally between 200 and 300 units. What is 200 units? 200 units is having two light bulbs or three light bulbs and one fan, perhaps two fans, and, and one power charger. That's it. So that's the level of poverty that we're talking about. So if you've ever seen a Pakistani whose clothes are ironed, or if you've ever seen a Pakistani who has a refrigerator and can basically buy milk in the, in, the, in the morning and save it for the evening for his children, he's not amongst the 68% of people of Pakistan who are living or consuming electricity at this level. 68% of people in Pakistan consume domestic consumers use less than 60, uh, less, use less than 300 units. So when we are asked to basically pass the real cost of electricity to the end consumer. I just want to set the context so that you can begin to understand whom are we trying to protect. So we had about five to, we had about six to seven billion dollars worth of 
predicted uh, subsidy or circular debt built into our power economy. But with the tariff rationalization that we've carried out last year, it has dropped now to a subsidy of about, I think, 200, I don't recall the exact numbers, but I think it's about 280 billion, which is $2.8 billion, or roughly $3 billion. And those $2.8 billion or $3 billion are going to these 68% consumers. Now, so what? And the answer to so what is that if we are able, if and only if we are able to bring our transmission and distribution losses down to 10% or less, even with the, 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 uh, the, the, the government taxes on power, we can bring the cost of, of, of delivery down from 14 cents roughly to about 11.7 cents. And if we are able to bring these transmission losses down, all of a sudden, 11.6, 11.7, 11.6 on the previous slide, this number, this number, uh, this number, which is the effective cost right now uh, to, to our end consumer, and 11.7, our power economy becomes sustainable. And that's basically the major takeaway that I, I want, want, you, want you to sit on, that if we are able to bring our transmission and distribution losses down, to about 10%, which is not going to be easy because right now it's north of 22%, so it's not insignificant. But if we were able to do this, then we will able to, we'll be able to have a sustainable and a viable power economy. Okay, so this is basically the statement of, of problem. Now I'll move towards the solution. And before I give you some specifics, I want you to understand that we have we 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 we, we reflected on, on on our challenges, and we said the problem is not just tactical. The problem is not that you have transmission losses do this. The problem is not that we have high cost of production bring it down. We have some organizing principles issue. We did the root root causing of of what was going on in the power economy, and we found out the following. We found out that this is right now the structure of the Pakistan's power market. Uh, we call it the red tape market. It's driven by regulations, opportunistic kind of transactions, and bureaucracy. These are the three pillars, three corners of how the power economy right now is organized in Pakistan. And what we want to do is move from red tape to red carpet. And how do we move to red carpet? And red carpet we want to lay out not just for our investors, which is what comes naturally to your mind, but also to your end consumers, and also to our employees. Because if we're not laying out this red carpet for everyone, our power economy is not going to transform. And we're going to move, we're going to move from red carpet to, to, to red tape to red carpet by, by these three drivers. We're going to move from, regulation, from bureaucracy to efficiency, from regulations to competition, and from opportunistic transactions to a sustainable uh, strategy for our, for our power economy. And so we believe that if we can change the founding principles or the organizing principles of the power economy of Pakistan, the rest shall follow. But if we continue to play this game of, well, what is that game, jack-in-the-box thing, where it, with something pops its head and you have to kind of, you never, I've never seen anyone winning at circus, um, any, anyone winning that game, so I don't believe we can win that game either. So we have to look at the, at the, the, the reasons behind all of these ailments and, and address those, uh, the, the reasons rather than just those ailments. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to bring, to bring forth uh, what we call efficiency? Three, three, three pillars of, of bringing in efficiency into our, into our structures. The first is merit order irrespective of whether basically it is, it is a dispatch order or it's payment or it's prioritizing who gets the fuel, we have to do all of this based upon merit. So if we're going to have a merit order in our generation, if we're going to have merit order in our transmission, and if we're going to have some sensible merit order in our distribution, then we believe that we would be moving towards efficiency. Now, how can you have merit order if you don't have transparency? Because uh, tr without transparency, if you have merit order, it creates a client-patron relationship, it creates a black market, and, and merit order just becomes another word for transacting in this black market. It's another, it's an, an, another, another algorithm. So we believe that the most important thing in making this transition is to create transparency, where everyone has information, it's equal information, information for all, information to all, and if we were able to have this merit order and make it visible through transparency, we would have efficiency. And if we don't, if we have efficiency and if we have this merit order or desire for merit, merit order, then what comes naturally out of that is, 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 is accountability. That we 
should appoint professional people, not necessarily the engineers just rising in the ranks. I mean, they are very competent people, and some of them should have leadership role. But we need to have competent leaders in various positions from within the market and from outside of the market to come and run this as a business, because it's not being run as a business as of right now. And in the wake of this merit order and in the wake of this transparency, we need to hold these people accountable. So we believe that if we are able to create a merit order and if we are able to create transparency around this merit and if we are able to hold people accountable, create a system of accountabilities where a single person has the responsibility, the authority uh, and, and, and the accountability, then we'd be able to, trans to, we'd be able to move our, uh, our, our power market more and more towards, uh, towards efficiency. Um, how are we going to create competition? Our competition, our framework for competition is, is a little bit of a mimicry of what Singapore did or uh, what, what, what uh, Dubai has more recently done or what was partly, partly tried by, by Ireland. And that idea was that we'll build and they'll come. Pakistan's brand is down, um, some, for, uh, some, some, some for unfounded reasons and some for, some for very well-founded reasons. And therefore, if we want people from outside to come and commit to Pakistan, we have to first commit to Pakistan. And the current government of Pakistan is basically committing and, 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 and commit, committing to building the infrastructure that is essential, and whether it be Ghadani or whether it be Dasu or whether it be Basha. In all of these projects, the government of Pakistan is saying, we are by God going to do this because we're doing it for our own children. If other investors come along and help us, we'd be able to do it in four years. But if they don't come along, we'd do it in seven. But by God, we're going to do it. And only with this kind of commitment, and, and if we are able to put resources behind this commitment, people would also begin to have a little bit of, little bit of confidence in Pakistan, and they would begin to, uh, to invest in Pakistan. So if you look at it, we basically are creating energy cities, we are creating energy corridors, we are creating public-private partnerships, particularly in large infrastructure projects in Ghadani, for example, in, the, in developing the port, in developing the, the, the corridor, the utilities infrastructure, in building up 6,600 megawatts of energy. In all of these areas, we are partnering right now with the private sector to move forward. And we're, doing, uh, we're working very closely with multi multilateral donors to come and, and, and join hands with us to build the large uh, hydro projects such as Dasu. And we are right now trying to find financing for Basha. So we are moving forward on Heidel, on coal, and a number of other accounts. And, and we are hopeful that if we continue to commit our um, uh, money where our mouth is, then, then the rest of the people would also kind of begin to participate in the development of the energy sector in Pakistan. Now, once we start to build this and we invite the private sector, then how are we going to, how are we going to transact? We, we believe that we would work through feed-in tariff rather than cost-plus model, because cost-plus model creates a black market. Uh, you know, someone wants to invest, another bureaucrat has to sit and go line by line and allow for this cost and reject the other cost, and that creates all kinds of suboptimal transactions and black markets. So we believe that we should upfront do our analysis and figure out what a fair return on a fair kind of reasonable investment is and give that upfront tariff, which gives very we believe aggressive returns to our investors and then do competitive bidding and let the best bidder win and let's get out of the way of the private sector by trying to control their transactions and their margins and figure out whether the cost of boiler is two dollars or twenty two dollars so that's not the job of the regulator that's not the job of the government our job is to do that analysis up front and then allow them and let them do let the competition come in and drive the cost down rather than the regulation and and like these detailed spreadsheets so that's how we are kind of first building the infrastructure, second, giving the upfront tariff and letting people bid and compete on that tariff. And the third and the more important part, and the part in which we haven't quite succeeded as much, is the real red carpet thing, which is a change of mindset. So we, we thought initially that in our ministry we would have what we call the key client managers, like in banks. So the job of our secretaries, deputy secretaries, joint secretaries, would not be to, to basically pull out a pen and say what is wrong, but to make our investors and make our consumers successful and run with them to the finishing line with integrity. So these are basically the, the this is the mechanism through which we believe we are going to bring about competition. And finally, sustainability. It's a simpler kind of equation. As I've shared with you already, our, our power mix is, is lopsided towards very high cost power. 
we need to move it down to low cost power mix and we're trying to create a balanced portfolio we're not hedging on a power um, uh, source uh, we've been we've taken a lot of kind of slapping on our wrist because of the word coal the c word uh, but but really i mean we're producing 0% of our electricity from coal and i believe the us is producing about 44 and china india is producing about 60 something and china is producing even higher so we're not thinking about having 100% of our energy coming from coal we just want to have a balanced portfolio so that our cost of production comes down and we We've come to coal reluctantly, grudgingly screaming, you know, because we know that it's dirty fuel. We know that it has burden on environment. We know that it has burden of health. So its holistic cost is not eight cents or seven cents. Uh, you know, it's, it's much higher. But we are a poor country and we have to create a portfolio that is affordable. So we're mixing it up with Heidel. We're mixing it up with some renewables. We're mixing it up with all of the other sources so that we have some sensible and balanced portfolio in which the coal component doesn't become like 90% or 70%, you know, but a reasonable percent so that we also have, like all other countries, a fair mix. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, and, and from just low cost energy we also are trying to 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 have a level playing field pakistan if you if you look at the gini coefficient of pakistan you would see how concentrated the wealth is and i've just given you one view of of the, of the level of poverty in pakistan so we have to protect and in our framework in our policy we have to protect the poor so we will protect the poor and we at some point in time may have to cross subsidize and charge the commercial enterprises or industrial enterprises a bit more but we're not at that point when we get there we'll cross that bridge but our principle is that we will continue to protect the poorest of the poor in pakistan in our desire to get rid of all of these um, subsidies and so on and so forth and finally, we cannot just continue to, uh, to, to, if we're going to think about sustainability, we cannot just look at the supply side, because supply is one part of the equation, the other is the demand side. So we are going to have a focus on, on, on demand management. We right now have a bill, which is, I believe, with the cabinet, which would be approved. And then that would allow us to do all of the things that we've been thinking about, time of the day metering and technology standards, the Green Star compliance standards and the building standards and so on and so forth. So with this combination, we would be able to build these three anchors of, of efficiency and sustainability and, uh, and, and competition. And if we're able to do so, we believe that we would have a reformed power market and a viable power market and a competitive power market and an affordable power market uh, and, and hopefully provide relief to the people of Pakistan. Uh, I'd now shift gears and talk a little bit um, uh, more about the more short to medium term things, specific things that we're doing, so that you don't believe that this is just like some theoretical uh, picture that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, is it okay? Do, do I have time? Sure, sure. Maybe another 10 minutes. Okay, good. So this is basically how we are thinking about, about our time frame and what all are we trying to do. In, from in, in the short run and in the medium run, medium term, and then in the long run. In short term, if you see, we it takes if we want to build a coal plant, it would take us about 40 months from from the from the first shovel in in the, in the ground to build up a coal plant. If we do mm, gas, it would take us about 30 some odd months. If we if we do if we do wind, it would take us about two years. So, so the bottom line is that. Right now, over a period of time, we have capacity that has been compromised because we've not serviced that capacity. I mean, I, just to give you an example, in Guddu, which is one of the power stations in Pakistan, there was an overall due. In 2005, it was not done. Then in 2007, it came up for, 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 an, for, for, for an overall, and the bids were called, and somehow the other, nothing was done. And then 2009, the bids were called, and nothing was done. And then 2011, the bids were called, and nothing was done. And in 2012, if anyone of you has gone to a coal, coal generation plant, when it stops, it takes it a day to stop. And the machines jammed because they were not overalled for about seven years, and the coal plant, the entire coal plant stopped in, in, in one hour, and the foundations of that coal plant, uh, of that power generation plant, uh, cracked. And, and, the, and the fans broke, and they were found about three kilometers from where the site was. Now, with this kind of maintenance, when people come around and say, we have, you have an installed capacity of 22,000 megawatts or 21,000 megawatts or whatever that number is, they're smoking something that I haven't, and I don't want to. 
because really, I mean, it's 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 uncanny. I mean, you go go unit by unit by unit, and you and you see what the problems are. But we have taken stock of those problems, and we are working on those problems. So our first idea, the shortest run thing that we're going to do is bring that existing capacity online where it is, where it can be brought online. Because when the foundations cracks, it's it's equivalent of setting up a whole new power plant. Uh, the second thing that we're going to focus on that I mentioned uh, to you was demand management. And the third is improving the management of our distribution system. That's the single most important thing. And that's what we are now geared up to do. And finally, to, uh, as a consequence of that, that to stop pilferage and, and, and uh, transmission and distribution losses. So this is our portfolio for the short run. For the medium run, we're going to focus on our large projects. We're going to focus on Gadani, which is our 6,600 6, megawatts worth of a, a coal power generation corridor. We're going to focus on Thar. We are going to focus on, and, and Thar has its own complications of mining, but nevertheless, we are committed and we are, we, we are focused on it uh, and, and working on Dasu. So these are projects which are going to take, the first phase of Dasu would take three, four years. Gadani would take four or five years. Thar may take four to six years. Uh, but these are medium-term things that have to happen for Pakistan to move forward. Now, along that, uh, along that trajectory, we are also, as you know, setting up LNG terminals. Uh, and this LN these LNG terminals would allow us to import gas. And, and, and if we succeed at some of the pipeline projects that we have, one of which is very controversial, and, 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 the, and, and build up these LNG terminals, then we'd be able to use gas as well. Because right now, we simply don't have gas. So we hear a lot about gas, gas, gas. But we don't have gas. And because we don't have gas, we cannot produce electricity through gas. And when we produce electricity through LNG, it is not going to be at $5 per million BTU, which is what our assumption is right now. It's going to be at $17 per million BTU. So it's not going to be as affordable as it is right now. So gas is not going to be a terribly, terribly inexpensive way of producing, but it's clean. And if it's relatively cheaper and it falls in our framework of under, under 10 cents cost of production per unit, then gas it is. And, and that's how we basically, through these LNG terminals and pipelines and, and coal projects and, and hydro projects, uh, what we are trying to do in the, in the medium run. And in the long run, run then we have these large hydro uh, infrastructures, bhashas of the world and dasus of the world and bunjis of the world. And I'm sorry about just throwing these words at you because I'm just trying to establish credibility that by God I know what these projects are. It's not like the, these words mean anything. Uh, but these are large infrastructure projects which, which would take about anywhere from seven years or five years or eight years to build. Um, and, and, and I think in these projects, we don't have to think about our political legacies and whether it's doable in four years or five years. This is what needs to be done for the country. And God bless us if we can do things in four years. But it doesn't matter one bit if we're unable to do it. But we have to do the right thing because we've been doing all sorts of wrong things for too long. And, and if these things have to happen in seven years, then they happen in seven years, and so be it. So quickly, taking a view on each one of these things, uh, these, this is the power that we have added over the past one year. It's about 2,200, 20, 2,100 megawatts of power that we've put into the grid uh, by fixing some of the available capacities and putting a little bit of new capacity. Some of the wind capacity is new. Some of the gas and, and, and furnace oil capacities are old. So it's a good mix. But uh, I must mention that not everything here that is listed here is online. We are having technical problems with some. So out of this 2,100 megawatts, about 1,600 megawatts is online, 15 to 1,600. And the rest, some, some, something, some, some project has gone down because a new boiler is needed because the old is not working and so on and so forth. But give or take, no matter how you cut and slice it, we've added about 1,500 to 1,600 megawatts last year. Uh, but the actual capacity that we brought online, not, not the operational capacity, is around 2,100 megawatts, which in, in a matter of months, if the boiler needs a replacement or someone, something is down because of a fault in old turbine, that's all getting fixed. So that's what we have done. And we need to continue along this trajectory to bring online the existing capacities. And, and we're committed to doing that. Uh, on the demand management side, as I mentioned to you earlier, there's basically a law which is in front of the cabinet. It's going to be approved. It's going to go to uh, our National Assembly. 
uh, and, and, and that would give us the, f the, the framework in which we are going to do all of these things. We, we have a view that we are going to have a sudden death phenomenon on, on, on the imports of all of the inefficient uh, motors and tubewell motors. There's about 20 percent equipment in Pakistan that gets imported that consumes about 80 percent of, of the energy. And if we basically meet the global standards, energy, green standards on, on, that, on those 5, 10, 15, 20 items, all of a sudden what we'd be importing from outside is going to be energy energy efficient and our energy burden would come down. For our local industrial infrastructure, just like the motor companies in, in, in the United States, we can't have sudden death because our industrial f footprint would evaporate all of a sudden. So we're going to give them three years and hopefully give them differential access to risk capital so that they can make investments and they can make this transition from producing uh, low efficient motors and whatever and not they're producing to, to to, to a standard that's going to be on par with the import standards. So that's uh, the game that we'd like to play after this bill is passed. On the time of the use metering, we right now have a very bizarre uh, marketplace where ma the markets are open till 11 p.m. And if you walk through Europe, I mean, U U.S. is again an exception uh, where, where you, you have commercial enterprises open till quite, quite late. But if you go to Europe, most of the commercial enterprises are closed around 6, 7 o'clock. And for a country that's energy starved, I think it would make sense. It's reasonably sensible to use the sunlight and do our commercial transactions during the sunlight. And at a reasonable point in time, whatever that point in time is, shut down the commercial enterprises and shave off the peak load. Uh, now, we don't want to regulate that. What we'd ideally, ideally like to do is use time of the day meters and continue to increase the cost of, of electricity in those four hours or five hours. And at some point in time, the market would, the, the price would clear out the market rather than enforcement and regulation. So that's kind of the thinking that we have in our new demand management framework. And finally, we're giving pricing signals. We've already uh, rationalized the tariff. It's already gone up. The hope is that the, our industrial footprint would now begin to use more efficient um, uh, kind of energy and efficient equipment. Because previously, if uh, you know, it's, it's quite bizarre. So five billion dollars is what our circular debt was, and so and, and and this entire portfolio of subsidies was. And I was shocked out of my wits when I realized that about 23 percent. So there are 22 million meters in Pakistan, of which 350,000 meters are industrial meters. So 22 million meters and 350,000 uh, meters. And these 350,000 industrial meters were drawing a subsidy of 24 percent out of the total subsidy in Pakistan. And that's gone out of the window, which is why people are quite unhappy. But so be it. Because it's unfair in a country where people cannot store milk for their children to use after five to six hours for people who are making money from consuming electricity to get 24 percent of the total subsidy. So that subsidy is all but gone out of the window. So we continuously, and I may be over harping on it, but we're going to protect the poor, but we're going to pass the, the real cost of electricity then to people who are using electricity for commercial and, and industrial purposes. Uh, that's kind of so. Pricing signal is going to continue to go so that it it it, it informs the 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 uh, the energy efficiency of the investments as well as the utilization of energy. Uh, the most important thing, as I said, was management. Now, the problem that we were having, the question that I'm hoping would come, and I suspect would come, and I fear would come, is that well, what have you done in the past one year? And if you are so gung-ho and you're so clear in your mind about all of these things, then why hasn't it happened? It hasn't happened because we did not have the infrastructure. And we're very grateful to USAID program, of, which has installed the smart meters at, at, at the 11 kV feeders, uh, which has allowed us now this infrastructure structure based upon which we can do evidence-based decision making and actually know where we're bleeding and how much we're bleeding and what do we need to do to kind of take charge of that and control it. But now we have that uh, infrastructure. So this basically is all I'm saying here is that we now have an evidence-based system. At 15-minute intervals, we're getting at all 8,900 or 9,000 approximate feed, approximately 9,000 feeders. At 15-minute intervals, we're getting how much energy comes in, how much energy goes out, and there are basically SDOs or subdivisional officers or engineers. Basically, every engineer is responsible for about five to seven of these feeders, where we now have locked the input and output, and we're going to hold these uh, engineers accountable. 
uh, for the energy that they've taken. So 22% or 28% of loss is unacceptable. Every engineer would give, will have to give a profit and loss statement of his seven feeders or eight feeders. We are not, we are refusing to take the profit and loss statements at the distribution company level. They will have to account for every feeder, adjust it for the feeder length, and it's through this that we are going to uh, uh, reform our power distribution uh, system and, and get rid of theft. So this basically is just to give you a view. You know, this is one of the dashboards that we're building for the Prime Minister. It tells exactly how much load shedding is going to be on a particular day. For example, in the Lahore, Lahore is one of the distribution companies. This would, this basically would be the, the, the this year's load shedding at compares to, as compared to last year's load shedding. This would be the urban and rural divide. This pie chart tells you what percentage of feeders had six, less than six hours of load shedding between seven and nine hours of load shedding, nine and 12 hours of load shedding. So we specifically know what is happening to the end consumers and what is the magnitude of pain that is being inflicted upon them by mismanagement, not because we don't have electricity. These are the real mug shots. So if you go into a grid station, you'd be able to pull up all of the feeders in that, in that grid station and ask a fundamental question, why is there so much variance? Why is it that the officers, this colony is getting four hours or six hours and this colony getting 12 hours? What's happening here? Because this is where the bootlegging takes place. This is where the load shedding is sold and bought and traded uh, in a suboptimal manner. So now this infrastructure gives us a very clear visibility of what is happening in the country and we can curb it and we can have an equitable uh, kind of framework for load shedding distribution. It also allows us to look at how load shedding has evolved over the course of a month or over the course of a year. So we would be able to track whether it's increasing, decreasing, and how it's moving. So this basically is the first day of the month, and this is how load shedding is moving uh, uh, on, on every feeder. And once this becomes public information, because we are piloting and beta testing it, everyone would be able to see what is happening to them and how it compares with their neighbors and people living in other distribution companies, and ask a fundamental question, why? And this is what I call transparency. In the absence of this transparency, mer merit order is just a hoaxy idea. This basically also allows us to look at the breakdown. This was a particular day when a, a grid station was out for about eight hours in a row. And, 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 and we now have a visibility that we can pull it up and we can see where basically the breakdown has taken place and why a whole grid station is out, which means 10 to 12 feeders and maybe half a million people. Why are they not having access to power? What has happened at this grid station for these many hours? So this is the level of transparency that allows us to reform our distribution. This is the, this is the evidence or the infrastructure that was essential for policy making and decision making and we previously did not have access to it. And every single time we asked for a number, we got a different number depending upon the time of the day and the mood of the guy who was giving that information. So now we have credible information coming. Uh, on the delivery, on the distribution side, we have taken three views. This is a traditional balance scorecard view. We have taken a customer view on distribution. And that customer view is the load shedding because that's what people are affected by and they're interested in whether I, how much, how much load shedding am I getting? Is it fair? Is it equitable? How it, does it compare with someone else? And why do I get more or someone else gets less? The second view is the operational view. And operational view is articulated as, as the transmission and distribution losses. And that's a code word in Pakistan for theft. So I've written theft rather than, uh, than transmission distribution losses. Uh, we have to kill this theft and we're committed to doing that. And finally, the financial view, which is receivables and collections. So I'd quickly give you an overview of these three views so that you can begin to understand the nature and, 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 and the depth of the problem that we're facing right now. So here's load shedding. Number one, the load shedding varies. It varies from 12 hours in some distribution companies to seven hours in other distribution companies. So there's no kind of you know, fairness in it. And, and just because it's become visible, we now will be able to create a fair framework. Similarly, within a grid station, you can see that it varies from three hours of load shedding at one, one distribution company to 23 hours of load shedding at another. And this kind of inequity is absolutely not sustainable. And we're committed to basically removing this kind of inequity. And interestingly, we found that there was no relationship between, between, between load shedding and, and, and no, no uh, relationship between load shedding and, and, and losses. Look at these. These are, the, these are the feeders which have the lowest uh, uh, um, um, 
transmission distribution distribution losses and look at the load shedding that they're getting and look at these suckers i mean they're they have they're the highest they're 40 to 50 percent uh the uh, distribution losses and look at their load shedding so now it's all become visible to us, or we've made it visible to us, and this is what we're going to use in to to uh, make sure that we have reasonable equity from uh, from the consumer perspective. Uh, and if we basically, as, and this is just the human suffering part of it, uh, we've just calculated what would be the impact if, if because of this load shedding, only three percent of the GDP is getting compromised. Then you can see that it's about. 630 billion uh, uh, rupees which are getting compromised every year because of 3% less GDP. And you can rem you, you can play around with it. You can do two, and it's, it's just a huge number. And that's basically the, the, the key point. And we believe that with the evidence that we have that I've just shared with you, the infrastructure that took us one year to build, we'd now be able to lock it and bring these losses down and bring this theft down and hopefully have a viable market. So that's basically the major point that I wanted to make. Uh, on the losses and theft, I'd be quick. Uh, these are the losses and theft in Pakistan. The average, you, you look at the benchmark, one of the distribution companies is 6.1% uh, distribution losses. And look at this, this is 20% distribution losses. So 6 and 20, that's that's really a very wide range, and, and we need to figure out why this is so wide and, 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 and decrease this standard deviation or variance across different distribution companies. Now, when you, we looked at one distribution company, I'm just giving you the example of the most efficient, one of the most efficient, the red one. This is one of the most efficient distribution companies. When we went to them, they said that their distribution losses were 10.8%. Fantastic, beautiful. I said 10%, right, at the beginning? I said if we can bring it down to 10%, it'd be fantastic. Well, when we double click on it and we found the separated the industrial feeders which are b2 b3 b4 feeders which are almost zero to one percent loss or zero to two percent losses the Mixed feeders, the residential and small commercial and small industry feeders, when you looked at them, they were running a 22% loss. Now, how can a feeder run on average of 22% loss in the most efficient distribution company in, 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 in Pakistan? And that was a question that we were uh, flabbergasted with. Uh, as if that was not bad enough, we looked at these mixed feeders and we found out that about 90% of these mixed feeders, 90%, so it's not like few people stealing, it's everyone stealing. 90% of these feeders basically had, were, were being underbilled. And the amount that was underbilled was parked at rural and remote feeders. So billions of rupees were underbilled, which alludes to some kind of irregularity, to say either incompetency or, or irregularity in terms of corruption. But be that as it may, whatever it is, it was costing the system an enormous amount of money. And, the, and whatever amount was underbilled was parked at remote feeders that they knew no one would raise any voice about, and they were showing up on the balance sheet over and over and over again, uh, but, but never taken any provision on the balance sheet for these billions of rupees parked, which compromises the viability of, of the power sector. As if that was not bad enough, we looked at those 3% loss industrial uh, feeders, and what, what, what did we found, find out? We found out that about 20, the top 30 feeders accounted for 64% of underbilling. So 60, about 30 different industries were being underbilled, and the total underbilling in that distribution company, 64% of that underbilling was parked within 30 different companies or 30 different feeders. And then the, 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 some, some of the more, more, more fortunate ones were being overbuilt. So exactly 30 companies were being overbuilt, exactly the same amount that was underbuilt. And the market was, the books were clearing out, but some people were being underbuilt and some people were being overbuilt, and the books cleared out at 3% losses. Now with this visibility again, I'm giving you these examples and, and putting them in front of you because we are confident that with this kind of visibility, we'd be able to solve these problems. So we also figured out, obviously, uh, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, but working with the engineers, I figured out that transmission distribution losses have something to do with the length of the feeder. So what we've done is we have segmented the, the, all of the feeders in Pakistan within a disco by their length, and we have set up specific targets for every length uh, within, so, with, so, for, so for what have we done? So for example, there are two different um, uh, distribution companies, one in a very hot area and one in a cold area. 
So if we just segmented the feeders by the length, the one that is in the hot area would say, oh, what are you, what are you doing? We are, we, 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 we're, living, we're in a very hot area, therefore our losses are going to be higher. So what we did is the following. Within the distribution company, we segmented all feeders. If they had 1,000 feeders, we segmented all of those feeders by feeder length. By 0 to 13, 13 to 30 kilometers, because 0 to 13 is urban feeder, and no law or rule of physics or engineering would allow for it to bear losses larger than 4% or 6%. I mean, you just cannot run. No matter what you do, you can't run a loss of more than 4 or 5% on a 13-kilometer feeder. So we took, took segmented the feeders by their feeder length, and then we took the top 25th percentile of that feeder length. So for example, 0 to 13-kilometer feeder length, we took the top 25th percent percentile of best performing feeder by losses, and we called them gold. And then 25 to 50 was green, and 50 to 75 was yellow, and the bottom 25th percentile in terms of losses within that 13 kilometer feeder is red. And we've asked them, told them, we've set targets. So the target is set within the disco by a feeder which is 13 kilometers, about a kilometer away from where the original feeder is, and we're saying, if he's doing six, you need to do six. So if you're green, if you're gold, and I'm jumping the gun because I want to conclude, if you're gold, we're willing to give you two years of your salary in bonus so that we shock the system. We give them incentives which are not marginal, which are remarkable. If you, in, in, our, in the green zone, we'd give you a, a, a half year's salary as bonus or a quarter of a year's salary as bonus. If you're in yellow and you don't get into green, you have six months, and brother, you're gonna be packed. And if you're in red, you have three months to get into yellow. And if you don't get into yellow, brother, you're packed. If we run this system across the country, and that's the proposed system, and I would like to stress test it with, with, with you guys, because for me, the, the value of this forum is that I present to you and you push me back. So before implementing, if there are any wrinkles or problems, we take those wrinkles and problems out. So this is the system that we're proposing. Uh, so to say, we're calling it a band it and move it. If you're in a particular band within a particular distribution company, if within a certain feeder length, you are the bottom red, you're going to be out or you move up. And if you're on the top, you get two years of your salary in bonus by the end of the year. So there's a reward and punishment regime, and there's a movement. The, and the model is dynamic because as your performance improves, the band for, for, for gold changes, the band for red changes. So the entire system, as people move, the band also begins to move up to optimal or, or high performance. So that basically is our strategy for improving the distribution, uh, for locking the theft and pilferage in the distribution companies. And we believe if we did this, the system would benefit, conservatively benefit, by roughly 41 billion rupees in, 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 in one, on one year. Um, our receivables, I'm not gonna go into it, but suffice to say that if we do nothing, our three months, our three month connected receivables, three month connected receivables, no spillovers, is, and without any government intervention, because they're interprovincial provincial disputes, and there's FATA disputes, and there's Jammu AJK uh, dispute, the number of disputes that the federal government has to settle. So if you throw all of those disputes out and, and you say, let the government settle when it may, and you just look at the private sector and the money that needs to be picked up from the private market right now, connected, it, those receivables are 187 billion. So we basically have set targets for all of these things. Um, and these are the collection rates. Again, these are the targets that we've set up for collection rates. So in essence, what I've said is that we're going to have equitable um, load shedding. We're going to bring the technical losses and theft down to hopefully zero at some point in time or as close to zero as possible. We're going to pick up all of our receivables and we're going to improve our collection rates. And we have linked all of this, the, 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 low, the, the collection rates, the distribution losses, and receivables with load shedding. So if you are red because you have high distribution losses, poor collections, and high receivables, you're going to get 10 hours of load shedding. But if you're gold, and you have fantastic and low distribution losses, and you have fantastic collections, and no receivables, 
you're going to get two hours of load shedding. So on the one hand, we're creating individualized incentives. On the other hand, as community, because that's where the theft takes place, we're linking it with load shedding. And we are hoping that if we succeed at doing all of this, we would basically be able to collect about $300 billion or $3 billion within a year. That would bring our circular debt to zero and make our, our, our market a viable market and hopefully help us achieve or move towards the goal that we have set for ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Moloch, for really a, a thoughtful and a pretty darn comprehensive uh, view into your plans, your strategy. You invited us to push back, and I'm going to accept that invitation. Um, there are a number of young people in this room, but there are also some gray beards, and the gray beards among us have heard for now a period over several decades, maybe even longer, um, some other pretty impressive energy strategies by a whole succession of governments. The problem seems always to be the implementation. So I want to ask you whether or not you think the following statement is a fair statement. Is it fair to say that at the end, in another three and a half to four years, at the end of this government's time in power, um, if Pakistan's energy sector has not been put on a sustainable basis, if the shortages, the load sharing have not been substantially brought under control, um, then this government has forfeited its standing to government and therefore should be replaced by a different government. I understand I'm putting you on a spot, but I, I, want, I want to get a sense of the urgency of the issue, whether or not you are so confident in your ability to implement these plans that this, in fact, is a fair, sta fair standard to judge this government by four years from now. Well, I, I think I think 100 percent. That's it. I, I, I think I think I, I think it wouldn't matter what we say. I think what you've just said will happen. It happened to the previous government, and there's no reason why it should not or will not happen to this government, and we're quite keenly aware of it, which is why we're coming up with all of these ideas. And we're going to win some, we're going to lose some, but we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we're moving in national interest. We're not moving in this direction only to win the elections. We hope to win the elections. We think if we perform, we will win the elections. But I think if we don't perform, we wouldn't win the elections, and we shouldn't win the elections. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we got time for just a couple questions. I got one back there, and I've got lights in my eyes. I think that's John, but I'm not sure. And over here. My name is uh, Jan Kalitsky here at the Wilson Center, and uh, I've spent the last 20 years in public and private sector work, not on Pakistan, unfortunately, but on energy issues. And the center has produced a book on energy insecurity, which I hope to get to you, sir, a copy. Uh, the main point of the book is that energy is important to analyze as has been done so well in your presentation in its own right, but it has to be interconnected with the broader economic and foreign policy and security strategy in order to be successful. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, make one comment and one question for you. One comment is there's nothing like a successful demonstration project which comes online right away. On the demand side, for example, here in the U.S., we have a thing called the Green Post Office in San Francisco. Uh, it's uh, a private sector project done for the government. It saves 30% of consumption per year. And that particular segment of the private sector, as an average, saves 30% uh, by way of efficiency measures, including insulation and solar and all the things that you expect, through its activities. It's fast. It's a fast go, it's a fast demonstration, it breeds confidence. Uh, on, the, uh, on the supply side, that's much more complicated. But, uh, I, and this leads to my question, uh, is there any further thought in Pakistan about making a major uh, opening for a coal to gas initiative? 
Uh, you mentioned a controversial pipeline. We know that that uh, one involves Iran. Uh, this goes well beyond the mandate of the energy sector, of course, but to the extent Pakistan is seen as visibly engaged in trying to stop the nuclearization uh, of, of Iran, uh, the chances for a gas supply, supply pipeline from Iran to Pakistan are obviously enhanced. Uh, similarly, there are issues involving Turkmenistan and the like. I'm not asking you to get into the world of energy so much as to ask you, is there any kind of dramatic statement that Pakistan can make, whether it's in this area or other areas, of a commitment to a gas economy at least so as to address the uh, environmental issues created by coal. Before you tackle that, let's put another <coughs> question on the table because we're short of time. <coughs> okay. Uh, I'm Nasir Kilji. I'm an economist at the U.S. Treasury Department. Uh, as Robert mentioned, uh, we've heard uh, previous economic uh, energy advisors to Musharraf, for example. I'm actually sitting with Mr. Ziyad here. He, in fact, was a discussion to a previous advisor 10 years ago. Uh, basically, I have uh, two questions. Uh, I'm not going to comment because we are running out of time. Sure. So I have two essential questions. As an economist, you've been talking about, uh, on the one hand, equitable, equitable load shedding. That's a very interesting uh, uh, word or phrase, equitable load shedding. Equitable, to my mind, is zero load shedding, okay, zero percent. So that should be the objective, not that, oh, well, your good behavior, we're going to give you uh, 22 or two hours, and another one we're going to give you 10 hours. The, the, the main objective should always be zero load shedding. Now, the question is, you mentioned that due to efficiency losses and distribution <coughs> losses, sometimes you call it theft. No matter which way those losses are, they are being used by someone, right? So it's being used in the private sector. It's not going away somewhere. So my question to you is, number one question, is in your mind, if those efficiency theft losses were to be eliminated, would the supply demand balance balance? Okay, would there be any deficit or not? Because I'm confused. So if you're basically saying that because of efficiency and theft, we have so much load shedding, then if that were to disappear without any additional infrastructure or investment, would that disappear, number one? Number I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually in interrupt. I'm sorry. We're already beyond okay, time. So number so two here is the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. If you're going to put quickly. in infrastructure, we're talking about resources. Where are you going to get those resources? Thank you. And yes. <clears throat> so uh, not in any particular order. I'd like to try to answer the questions. Equitable is zero. No questions asked. If you look at the targets that we have set, they set zero. But zero doesn't come into being overnight. So for the time that we are moving towards that zero, we have basically people who are getting 18 hours of load shedding and people getting two hours of load shedding for no obvious reason. People who are stealing are getting less load shedding. I've, I've just shown you in that chart. And people who are paying are getting more load shedding. And that's what I mean by equitable. I mean, no country in the world would define equity in terms of giving load shedding or darkness or lack of power. We're not living in stone ages. So obviously, our target is zero. And it was very clearly articulated up front in the second slide where we said the supply and demand gap has to come down to zero. But I think in this presentation, I've tried to show you with clarity that there's a pathway, there's a migration pathway. We're not going to move from 10, 11 hours to zero overnight. So that journey, in that journey, we'll have to share pain. And the sharing of the pain also has to affect our values, whether they be paying for the electricity or paying our taxes or whatever not. So the structure that we've put together not only moves us towards that end game of zero power, but along that journey also instills some values of paying your due share and getting rewarded for paying your due share. The countries in the world where people pay their taxes because they have a firm belief that their country is going to provide them with all the facilities. And there are countries where people don't pay their taxes, and there's a firm belief there that whatever money we're paying is going into someone's pocket, and that belief has to change. So those values have to change, and the performance of the government has to improve. So what we've tried to do in this brief presentation is share with you that framework which would allow you to do all. 
um, I, if we if we basically get rid of all of the distribution losses, no, we would still have load shedding. So the answer is very straightforward because we've calculated all of that. We've looked at the demand function and we've looked at the supply function and there's a gap between supply and demand. And no matter what we do, we're going to have load shedding. And um, uh, uh, the demand function that we have, I must mention or I hasten to add, is a suppressed demand function. Because over the past 10 to 12 years of load shedding, people have given up on the hope of having electricity. They, therefore, their, their utilization is informed by that. While there, there's morbidity because of the theft, where there's a lot of wastage and pilferage. Because when you're getting it for free or when you're getting it with, with a certain level of what you call um, subsidy, you gain more by wasting more. So as we basically rationalize the tariff, and we have done that, and as we basically cut on this theft part or misutilization part, then obviously it would come down. But on the other hand, our utilization, our demand function is a suppressed demand function. We, no one is setting up energy intensive industry in Pakistan. No one is setting up in energy intensive commercial enterprises in Pakistan. And as soon as we, as soon as we start providing energy to people and they get the confidence that yeah, yes, there's gonna be reliable energy, you would see a rocky a hockey stick kind of impact on the demand function. So some elements would bring it down, but most elements would pull it up. So the answer is no. We're not going to have, we're not going to resolve this issue simply by working on theft, but it would create an equitable framework and it would move us in the right direction moving forward. Uh, the third uh, comment that you have was about resources. Right. I, I, think, um, I think that's a difficult question. Uh, I, I, I've already told you that one of our strategies is, is, is the same, is, a, is, is akin to uh, Singapore and, and Dubai, where we're saying we'll build and they'll come. Uh, I think that's one answer, that we are committing, we are putting our money where our mouth is, so we're not waiting for someone to do it. Our framework is very simple. We're doing it for, for our children, so we're going to do with the investors and without the investors, because the cost of not doing is enormous for us. Social, political, hum human cost, uh, developmental cost is enormous for us, so we are going to, by God, do it. That's the first thing. The second is that I think I hope to God, and I think you guys are a better judge than myself, that there's a little bit more confidence in the investors and in the rest of the world that Pakistan probably is moving in a little better direction than before. And that may give some confidence to people in the, in the way of investing. Uh, that Pakistan is at war. Pakistan is trying for once for all to solve its uh, security kind of challenges. If we succeed at that, I think more investments would come. But even without the war, which just started about a month or two ago, which is ongoing in North Waziristan, if you, if you look at the situation, uh, China alone has made a commitment of about 30 some odd billion, 30 to 34 billion dollars worth of investments uh, to Pakistan. And I think that's a pretty significant. Of those 34 billion, and this is not Chinese number, so I'm cautioning you, this is our number. We've looked at all the projects and we've priced it and we said it's about a package of 30 to 34 billion dollars over the next five to seven years. Quite significant. Of that, 18 billion is our commitments in, in the energy sector. Similarly, a single GCC country right now is on the verge of doing financial closure of investments of four billion dollars. And I'm personally involved, so I know how close they are to the financial closure. Now, $4,000 million worth of investment in the very first year of the government and a commitment of $34 billion is, I, I'm not saying it's fantastic, but I'd, all I'm trying to do is tell you that we're moving in the right direction we're trying to do. And in all of these investments that we're talking about, there's not one word of corruption that has so far come to, to the surface. I mean, it was a word which was being used synonymously. You know, every, every, every project was some kind of some kind of uh, irregular transaction going on. So you've not heard any about any corruption. It's not become visible. It's not come forth. Um, and I think with these, the confidence is improving, and it's basically a game that has to be played out. It's not either or. Confidence is neither lost in a year or not, nor, nor gained in a year. If we stay the course, if we, um, if we show some integrity, I think we'll get investments. And the final question that was about the gas economy, I think, yes, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think I use the word balanced portfolio. Um, and in that balanced portfolio, we have wind, we have solar, but these are expensive, uh, very expensive forms of energy. Their availability is very low. Solar's availability right now in photovoltaic is less than 20%, which means for every 1,000 megawatts, what we're going to have available is 200 megawatts. 
The wind availability right now is about less than 30 percent, which means for every thousand megawatts of wind, what we're going to have available in a, in a reliable manner is going to be 300 megawatts. So the base load has to come from thermal. And we and gas is one of those thermal areas, and we that's why we are building up these LNG terminals right now because we also don't know where the pipelines are going to go, but we're not going to wait. I mean, it's not like another Kalabagh, if you're familiar with it. We're not in the process in the in the business of creating another Kalabagh, this or that. It's not this or that. We are a nation. We're going to have a broad portfolio of opportunities. Our strategic intent is to open opportunities at every decision note, not to close them and peg our, our bets on just one Iran pipeline project or 10 projects or three projects. So we, we, we have a broad portfolio. We're looking at local coal. We're looking at imported coal. We're basically looking at LNG terminals. We are calculating the cost of energy if we used LNG, which is not going to be inexpensive, as inexpensive as it is right now, but it's clean. It, the burden on environment is low. The burden of health is low. So overall cost is quite, quite good. Uh, we're very bullish about it. So we are at the end going to have a reasonable and balanced portfolio, which is going to have some renewables, some gas, clean energy, and some dirty energy. Well, I have to play the bad cop here and um, call this session to a conclusion, um, simply because I don't want to eat even more than we already have eaten in the time for the next panel. but. Um, I, I, I can't resist uh, the opportunity to say that um, notwithstanding what the impression that I think many in Pakistan have, Pakistan has a lot of friends and well-wishers um, in this city and in this um, country. And all I can say is all of us wish and hope that you succeed 100 uh, percent in your very important task. So our, our thanks to you for joining us today, and good luck uh, if you'll join me. And very grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask the next panel to come up here right now? I really do want to get us started in about three minutes, so there's not going to be a whole lot of turnaround.